Hello, Moto America fans. This is Paul Carruthers, and this is our weekly Moto America podcast, Off Track with Carruthers and Vice. As I mentioned a few seconds ago, I'm Carruthers. I've got Vice across the country, but joining me today, as always, for our weekly podcast in which we speak about Moto America and sometimes other forms of racing as well. But uh, how are you today, Sean? I'm great. I mean, we've been talking a little bit, you and I, how, um, you know, I think for you, it might be a little bit of jet lag getting back to California. I'm only an hour in the diff different time zone by an hour, but we did so much over the weekend, even though it was only our Medallia Superbike class that takes a couple of days to recover from all that. There was and, and a lot of running around for all of us, I think. Yeah, and I'm going to partially blame it on the fact that I, I was kind of overserved on Sunday night, thanks to, <laughs> thanks to the South Africans that I've never seen more South Africans in my life than what was at the the place I was at on Sunday night in in Austin. But uh, I think they had they had the whole country there. But yeah, so I think that wore me out a little bit because that ended up being a late night to finish things off. But it was a lot of fun and uh, I thought the weekend was great. It's always, it's always good to catch up with all, you know, I know a lot of people in that MotoGP paddock, so it's always nice to see them. And I hadn't seen them in a while because we missed the one race with the, uh, with COVID. And then last year we couldn't work it out with the schedule. So it's been a couple of years since we got to see those people. So it was, uh, it was really cool. And I thought our races were, were good. Uh, MotoGP was good. I mean, the, I thought it was, the whole weekend was, uh, was really nice. Yeah, it was good. You know, it's funny with me, um, you know, there's still a huge part of me that's a fan. So whenever I go to Coda, um, there's always people that I, you know, admire and want to see that, you know, aren't in our series. And Paul, I know you know this, but I got a chance to finally talk to Simon Crafar, who you had commented is, is really advanced and done such a good job over the years and as a commentator. And um, you know, so I finally got a chance to meet him and, and, uh, congratulate him for his, his 1998, uh, win at the British Grand Prix on a, on a Yamaha 500 two strokes. So That's funny. It took a while, but, uh, he was happy. He seemed pretty pleased that somebody remembered that. So that was good. Yeah. And I had, as you know, I had Kenny Roberts duty yes. for the weekend, which is enough to keep you busy. Uh, we had a good time. It was, it was fun hanging out with him. I hadn't, I hadn't got to hang out with him for a while and, he was there as a guest of Dorna and, and handed out the, the trophy to the MotoGP winner, et cetera. And we had him on the grid and all kinds of stuff. So we had him running around quite a bit, but I think he enjoyed himself and, and people get a kick out of seeing him and talking to him because you, you know what he's like. He's a, he's a pretty funny individual. Yeah. You know, do you think, do you think he knows he's funny? Um, yeah. Okay. He has yeah. that kind of twinkle in his eye, doesn't he? When he says stuff sometimes it's like, yeah, I think he's, he knows he's funny, but it's, it, it comes natural to him. I mean, he's not, he's not a fake funny. He just, most of his funny is just really quick witted, you know, Very quick -witted. right to the jugular type stuff, you know? So he's, uh, <laughs> it, it, he doesn't spend any time writing his material at night, but he sure has good stuff. So he really does. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it was fun. Yeah. So anyway, let's, uh, we, we have a good guest today. Actually, it's Michael Gilbert. Michael, uh, Michael finished fourth in the Moto America Stock 1000 championship last year. He had one win and four other podiums. I didn't even notice, but until I was doing a little research this morning, but he was only five points away from finishing second in that championship. So it was, uh, it was really close. I, Jake Lewis kind of got away from everybody a little bit on the points, but, uh, for second place, it sure was close. So he he just narrowly missed out on getting second. He also finished fourth in the Superbike Cup, and uh, at Mo at Road America uh, at Coda, he actually raced in Superbike, and will be racing in Superbike this season. He he had a little tip over in race one, but was able to finish tenth in race two. You know, I'm pretty I'm kind of proud of little Michael Gilbert because what he I don't know if you made it down to his his pit, but he now is. He's a full team owner. Uh, he's got a semi. He's got a crew. So it was, you know, I walked in there and saw all his stuff and everything, and it was it was hard to not be impressed because, I mean, he he's put, he puts this stuff together himself, and and you know, it's something that he's really wanted, and now he's got it, and he's you know, he's a big time team owner, big player in the Moto America paddock. So it's kind of cool to see. Yeah, I mean, 
let's let's bring Michael in and and I gotta I gotta jump on that in a second. But Michael, um, you got an announcement to make. Let's let's announce your team here. Let's do that. Yeah. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Um, yeah, 2022. We are the Cycle World powered by Octane Chuckwalla Valley Raceway team. That's a long name. Uh, <laughs> but man, like you said, this is something we've been trying to put together and I haven't probably slept in four or five months, but uh, now it's on the road and, and you know, I'm extremely proud of it. Like, as, uh, as Paul said, too. So, man, it's been a it's been the creation or the result of a lot of hard work. So now we're finally going. Yeah. And, you know, Michael, I want to say to, to what Paul said, you know, I saw I went by your paddock area and Josh Merrill was in there working on the bike. Of course, he's one of your crew guys and a good friend of yours as well as Paul's and an acquaintance of mine. And I'd say he's a good friend, too, but I'm too far away. But anyway, I remarked to him, I was like, my gosh, that truck just looks fantastic. The branding on the side, I think it's with the black and all the brands pop so well on it with, like you said, the Octane uh, group and, and, you know, the cycle world brand, which is obviously world renowned. Um, but you know, you've always had a, a good program over the years, but you have really, really stepped up this year and it's proper. I mean, you, you look like an absolute premier team right out there and, uh, it's very impressive to see. So huge congratulations to you. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate that. Michael, how, how difficult is it to do what you've been doing as far as the team owner stuff? I mean, you've been doing that for a while. Obviously, it's a different level now, but it it seems to me from the outside looking in, it, it's it's probably as hard, if not harder than the actual racing the motorcycle part. Yeah, racing the motorcycle is easy. Uh, no, I mean, like I said earlier, it's it's been it's been the result of a lot, a lot of hard work um, and four or five months literally taking everything I can just to get some sleep at night. Um, it is very difficult. And I've learned so much about all of this in the last three or four months, you know, even from coming from a team owner, owner perspective of the past, but it was obviously a much smaller capacity um, to make this step with the semi to make this step. We're going to have other riders coming in and, and just continuously building. It's been a very, very difficult thing to do. But like I said, I'm, I'm very proud of it to see it roll up on, on Thursday at Coda was a, you know, I almost shed a little bit of a tear there. So um, <laughs> we're just, uh, it's only the beginning. That's all I have to say. You know, Michael, question for you. I, obviously people know you as a moto journalist. You've been doing it for several years, although it still belies the fact that you're, you're still very young. Uh, you started out real young in this, but I want to ask you this question. Are you a motor moto journalist? journalist who road races or are you a road racer who is a moto journalist and has that changed over the the past few years i would say that i'm a road racer turned moto journalist um i mean it's really kind of a funny story how i fell into moto journalism um it was all very quick and i didn't really expect it to ever happen bradley adams who is now actually back at cycle world with us uh Previously, he was a sport writer, and and the story is, is that I was sitting in class in high school, um, and he texts me, and he goes, hey, what are you doing next Wednesday, Thursday? I'm like, dude, I'm at school. Like, I got to go to school. And he's like, well, can you uh, can you come help um, help me with a comparison test that we're doing at Sport Rider? And somehow I convinced my my parents that I was going to go out to Chuckwalla Valley Raceway, help him with this comparison test, and they let me out of school and did it, and then it just became more and more work with the sport rider guys. And I landed a job there and now I'm at cycle world. Um, so I truthfully just fell into it. And that being said, I would say I'm much more of a road racer turn moto journalist, but in recent years, um, I feel I've taken a very large step in, in my profession of, of moto journalism and the testing regiment that we have at cycle world and kind of analyzing different and deeper details than maybe I, have in the past or as a road racer i have to look at it as a consumer perspective as well do you talk about this new situation this year and with regards to i mean we i mentioned josh merrill we know he's been with you for a couple of years now and but you have you have this proper transporter uh big rig um what's on it and who is on your team now do you have additional personnel than you've had in the past yeah, so I'll start by saying, um, as I previously mentioned, 
The name of the team is Cycle World Powered by Octane Chuckwalla Valley Raceway uh, Team. Now, what we did there is obviously we brought Cycle World back into the paddock. Cycle World um, has a pretty extensive history being in the AMA and, and Moto America paddock. Uh, previously with Eric Bostrom, I believe that was in 2010, and then Hayden Gillum later on, I think that was 2017. Um, and really what we wanted to do there was essentially highlight Cycle World's authority in, in what we do, unbiased reviews and storytelling. Um, and help connect the dots of Octane, which is our parent company. So um, we wanted to basically provide the end-to-end -end digital buying experience. You know, someone comes to Cycle World, they re read a review of a motorcycle and, and become informed about all this, this uh, the landscape of motorcycling. You get pre-approved for, for a loan right on our site, and then we head off to the dealership and buy a motorcycle. So it's really important for us to get out into the paddock, into the demographic that that's actually buying motorcycles. Um, and then along with that, Chuckwalla Valley Raceway, they've been a huge supporter of mine for many, many years. Um, I actually just recently wrapped up a fourth in a row, uh, number one plate out at Chuckwalla Valley Raceway, um, which has really become a winter hotbed for, uh, for professional racers. It's, you know, on any weekend, you'll see myself and Corey Alexander and and Andy DeBrino and Brandon Pash was there, and Dave Anthony. I've seen Tony Elias there, I've seen Jason Aguilar. Like there's been so, so many people um, that come that it's, it's really been an incredible series and, and a good way to stay sharp during the winter. Um, now, in terms of personnel, yes, Josh Merrill's with me. He's my, my mechanic, um, just really an amazing guy that I know has my back. And then I brought in Quentin Robles this year. Quentin is, you know, my new crew chief. Um, and, and we really kind of began to mesh and, and start to work really well as a group. Um, and with the truck, my deal with the semi truck is that I actually brought Mike Pond of Tune Racing back into the Moto America paddock. And, and he's basically in charge of all the equipment on the transport side of things and drives it, maintains it, or maintains it and has really lent a hand in reducing some stress for me, um, getting this whole thing off the ground. Now, as far as you, you mentioned, you could just, a guy could just, could somebody even of like, not very good character, like Sean buys by a motorcycle that way? Yeah. <laughs> well, absolutely. Um, yeah, absolutely. We try and make it as easy as possible. You know, if, if, if you guys are interested in, I don't know, let's say a Suzuki GSXR 1000, here's your first look, first ride, full test, comparison test, buyer's guides, and within all of those different stories is a link to basically sign up, get pre-approved for finance right there on our site, head over to a dealership, and it should be a very seamless in and out experience. Well, there you go, Sean. Yeah, I mean, heck, I could, uh, I, I, my, my danger is past, you know, I could get past that. But, uh, hey, I want to go back to something real quick. Hey, Paul's going to, Paul's going to laugh about this because he says I love everybody in the paddock, but I do need to call somebody out that you mentioned who I did not even know was at Coda. And that's my, my uh, beloved Mike Pond. I love that guy. I mean, man, the stuff he did with Bryce Prince and Jason Aguilar and, you know, to try to stay in our series with tuned racing over the years. And, you know, I think he moved to Nevada at one point, maybe he's still there. You, you can tell us Michael, but I didn't. So he was, he was at Coda this weekend and I didn't even get a chance to see Mike. He was there. Come on. Oh, come on bias. I'm, that's terrible. I got it. Really tells you how much you came around and said hi to me even. <laughs> well, I was such in awe of that truck. I mean, I, I was kind of almost afraid. I mean, like I said, I sort of said hi to Josh Vero from a distance. I think I waved to you at one time, but I didn't even see Mike, but I'm so glad he's working with you. He's, He's such a good guy, right? I mean, and he knows what he's doing. So you got, you got some good people there. Absolutely. You know, Mike is, uh, Mike has been amazing in this whole process. We did a deal together that we're actually using the X, uh, tuned racing truck. Um, and he's really lent his expertise and knowledge and, in, in, in everything surrounding running uh, a semi truck and even running a team and has really lent me a hand in a lot of things. Um, and in a general sense, yes, I have an amazing group of people around me that has really made this whole thing possible and, and had my back, even in the tough times when, um, pulling hair out at the dinner table, trying to figure out how to make this whole thing work. But we, uh, we brought it all together and it's going to be a really fun year. 
Now, Michael, I know, I think part of your plan is to grow the team and you're gonna, men, you're gonna tell us who these other riders are because we didn't get to that part earlier, but it's kind of, it, you're kind of like following the pattern created by David Anthony a little bit, aren't you? A little bit. If, if, if I got to give credit to one person that really kind of got this whole thing off the ground is Dave Anthony. He's the one that put the idea in my head to do this whole thing. Um, but yeah, we're, we have kind of been following the process of what Dave Anthony has done here. So tell me about these riders. I know it's not just going to be you under that big awning as we get to road Atlanta. So at road Atlanta, we're going to have Owen Williams. Um, he'll be racing the junior cup on a Kawasaki Ninja 400. Um, and he'll be with me all year. Owen is, is a really amazing kid. Um, really down to earth. He's 14 years old, but you, you talk to him and he probably sounds like he's 30 with all of his knowledge, uh, um, and kind of humble roots. Um, but anyways, he'll be joining us for the junior cup and, and continuing us all, continuing on all year. Um, and then we'll have, I'm hoping another rider join us about halfway through the year. He'll, he will also be stocked out as a superbike or maybe superbike cup. I'm not sure what that structure will look like. Um, but you know, fingers crossed, we'll have three of us under that awning and, uh, and that'll be just the beginning. And then maybe we will be able to build into something even bigger in 2023. Now, do you work with Owen? Not, in, in, you, not, you're a little bit more than just like a guy that brings his bike to the race. I mean, you help the kid and stuff, right? Absolutely. That's kind of what I pitched the pitched the whole idea of running this semi truck was in the first place is, is Owen is a local uh, California kid out at truck Valley raceway all the time. He's, he's, uh, he's been a part of the JP 43 training program with Jason Pridmore, which obviously um, I do a, an extensive amount of coaching with. So it was a way of, you know, how can we bring Owen and some other riders um, into this program and basically place them in a situation where, you know, myself and the guys I have around me have all been doing this for eight or nine or 10 years or even longer and basically lend them that knowledge and help them along the way. Because in 2021, sorry, 2021, Owen went out racing with his dad and, you know, they didn't really have any guidance. So how can we help these kids along the way uh, and just, you know, without being thrown to the wolves of professional racing so much. Hey, Michael, can you tell me, well, tell us all, because I've struggled a little bit to try to understand this myself, let alone try to explain it to some people. And it's, you know, there's been some changes in what I would call the hyper bike or the leader bike class over the years. I mean, we've had super mm -hmm. stock 1000. We've had super bike all along. Super stock 1000 was, was a little bit different than what stock 1000 became but this year there's and then we had superbike cup which was stock 1000 bikes that we could race in superbike races and there was an in in incentive with tires and things like that but this year i believe you are doing stock 1000 but you're racing kind of separately in superbike on your stock 1000 bike but it's not superbike cup i don't really what was your what's your incentive to do that versus superbike cup I, you know, what's the differentiator there? <laughs> I mean, I, I really don't get it. So help me. <laughs> so essentially, uh, we chose to go superbike route as Moto America now considers what we have a premier superbike entry, um, which means we have Moto America support and running this whole program um, and helping get it off the ground. And that that really allowed us to run the semi truck. And with semi truck comes extra brandy and an extra hospitality to where we could kind of draw a little bit more money and help push us up into the superbike class now obviously we're also going to race stock thousand um and and i'm out to win that championship as well while the superbike is really going to be sort of a developmental year um going full-time into that class i hope by you know sometime around mid-season we will um have what i've been calling a hybrid superbike something that will get us a little bit further up the road in the superbike races, a little bit different than the stock thousand um, spec machine, make it a little bit easier to ride a little bit faster and, and get us some better results. Um, and then off into 2023, I plan on being in superbike full time. When it, you, Paul had mentioned um, David Anthony and, you know, I didn't realize that you had kind of modeled your deal after David, but I can see that now and it makes a lot of sense. And David's been in our paddock for a long time. 
um, he'd kind of told me off the, during the off season when he was trying to figure out what he was going to do this year that, you know, he, he kind of said if he, he wanted to be kind of top five or top, you know, within the top, well, he did say top five in Superbike, And he said, if he wasn't going to be able to achieve that, you know, he might put somebody else on the bike or something. Um, so my question to you is, well, I wonder what David's going to do. And do you, will you have a second rider in your program? And do you see that your program over the next few years expanding even more? And, you know, is there any connection with David at all since that was mentioned, I guess? Uh, there is no connection. There's no direct connection with Dave in terms of, of anything really kind of happening this year. Like I said, Dave was kind of the one that really put this whole idea in my head to try and run this whole program. And I will say that Dave has been amazing um, in the off season, kind of helping answer questions and, and, and lending his knowledge into how he's gone about this. And especially with semi trucks and everything else like that, that I really had no prior knowledge of, um, you know, a little bit, same thing. Actually, I'd say a little bit, uh, the. It's the same thing with Kyle Wyman. Kyle Wyman, I saw him out a Harley Davidson event for, uh, for Cycle World. And um, he's been very helpful in answering questions and very willing to answer any sort of questions. So the whole paddock is really behind helping it, helping everyone in the paddock is, is behind helping the paddock grow. Um, it's, it's equally beneficial for all of us. Now, you got an echo. Michael, you've also switched um, from Kawasaki to Suzuki. Did you go the, the entire off season, the racing and stuff at Chuckwalla? Was that all on on Suzuki's? So we made the change to Suzuki. Uh, the first time I threw a leg over the Suzuki for 2022 was in January. So we had about three Chuckwalla um, weekends on it, and then we had one other test day out at Button Willow. Um, so truthfully, not a lot of time. But yeah, we made that that transition from Cowie to Suzuki, and I, I couldn't be more stoked at this point. Now, is that are you getting uh, is is Team Hammer help, or did they build the bike, or is there any connection there at all? Yeah, absolutely. I went straight to Chris Ulrich um, and Team Hammer, and they we basically did a, a purchase of a motorcycle and a technical support pr program um, to where I have their full support on race weekends. It's really refreshing to have. Uh, Chris and his guys in, in, in my pit setup following every session um, just to check in, see how it's going, see what they can lend a hand with. But really, it's been amazing and, and something that I've been looking for for a few years. Truthfully, I was trying to race a Suzuki in 2021, um, and there was just a couple uh couple factors behind it that we ended up racing the Kawasaki again in, in 2021. Um, and then with building this whole program in 2022, I decided, you know, what, I'm just going to do what I want and build the program around me that I want, that I'm comfortable with and what I feel is conducive to success. Um, and that's really what's led us to Suzuki and our partnership with Team Hammer. You know, Michael, I found out over the weekend by talking to John Ulrich as well as David a little bit that back to David Anthony, and I don't mean to make this all about him, but I guess he's a, you know, he's kind of a de facto test rider for a team hammer as well. So that's interesting that hammer built your bike. I mean, it makes sense with what their background has been with Suzuki, but the one thing I want to mention, you mentioned about Eric Bostrom and Hayden Gillum, there's been a legacy with Cycle World to have to be involved in, in road racing. And I mean, it even goes back further. I know Paul remembers this, and I certainly do that Don Kinney would go to Daytona a lot and they, or they do stuff at Willow or whatever. So there's always been a pretty good connection between Cycle World and, and racing and, and supporting it. I mean, with Hayden Gillum and that man in a van with a plan thing was so cool. But the one trend I just happened to think about is Eric Bostrom was on a Suzuki, uh, Hayden Gillum was too, and now you are with Cycle World. Is there any, is it just coincidence with that? Yeah, it's absolutely just coincidence. That's funny, I never thought about it like that. <laughs> Bostrom was on a Suzuki, Sean? Yeah, he, he yeah. was with attack on a Suzuki. Um, it's funny, Matthew Miles still has that bike. It's a GSX-R1000, obviously, yeah. Um, and I know, Michael, you know that as well, but, and obviously Hayden was, he, Hayden was in, wasn't it Super Stock 1000 when, when Hayden Gillum was riding? 
I he was in so. Superstock Thousand, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, it's interesting how Cycle World has been around. And I mean, it's obviously a, an iconic brand the world over. And boy, I mean, it's got to be interesting for you. That brand in the time you've worked for them has gone through such a large transition as have all magazines with the whole idea about print going to kind of online and, and what you're doing now. Um, does the does the basis of a lot of what you do, is it still the same as it was? I mean, you still test motorcycles and write about them, right? I mean, it, it's just now it's online. Is, it, is that an accurate assessment of what you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. I think <clears throat> obviously Octane purchased us in uh, at the end of 2020, and we've really gotten back um, strictly to testing motorcycles, which is which is really refreshing. Obviously, that's my background and skill set. Um, but yeah, we review any and all motorcycles that we can get our hands on. Personally, I'm in charge of actually writing and reviewing uh, these motorcycles. Um, I'm also in charge of dynoing all the motorcycles and weighing and measuring all the motorcycles that we get in the house and then also taking them out to the airstrip and getting performance numbers, quarter mile, zero to 60, um, breaking performance numbers as well. So yeah, it's, uh, it, it really is a refreshing take is to just get back to the core element of our business as testing motorcycles. Yeah. And I mean, the other thing about you guys, it, I have I have stacks of the buyer's guides from way back. And those things have been a big deal for Cycle World over the years. Is, is, that, is that buyer's guide still an important part of what you guys put out every year? Buyer's guide is absolutely crucial. So again, now with Octane owning us, um, we're looking to connect the dots in the buying experience and inspire people to go buy motorcycles. And these buyer's guides, we try and give, give readers and enthusiasts all the information you could possibly imagine about each one of these models um, and how they've evolved through the years. So if anything, I would say buyer's guide is even more critical than it has been in the past. And Michael, what would you say is the state of, of motorcycling for consumers right now? I mean, we've heard all these stories and, and read that during COVID, people kind of were home. So they bought everything from UTVs to ATVs to dirt bikes to street bikes. And it seemed to boost motorcycling and uh, the motorcycle industry. Are we still riding that wave or it, and it, how, will it continue for a while? Or what's the state right now? How are sales of, of bikes in general? Uh, I cannot, I, I can't comment on actual numbers, but I think that, yes, we're still riding that wave a little bit. Um, I think that obviously the motorcycle industry, we've seen a nice uh, boom since COVID and, and people are out riding. Um, the biggest hope is that all these people and first time buyers and first time riders that we, we acquired during COVID will continue on and hopefully lead to uh, like lifetime lifelong motorcycling careers so so you call it um and see but yeah i would say that we're uh motorcycling is definitely in a good spot right now and i think that it will tailor at some point it's only natural as people get back to work and 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 responsibilities change again um but you know fingers crossed that it continues on well i i can't go through this podcast with michael gilbert without talking about Jason Aguilar a little bit. Uh, yes. You know, we talked about the the, the semi and, and the new team and, and what you've been able to put together there. And and I when I went and visited your 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 team, he's missed. I mean, I I I miss seeing his I, I miss his smart ass attitude. I miss him giving me shit. I miss his animal crackers. Uh, I just he I just think he's a guy that had a presence in that paddock and it wasn't this overpowering presence but you just knew he was there and he always had a smile on his face and he was always he was just a cool guy to hang out with and I Michael I know you you must miss him tremendously yeah absolutely man you're getting me a little choked up over here no yeah, sorry Jason. about that no 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 I think um Jason was one of my best friends. And, and in 2021, I called him and asked him to be my crew chief when I knew his racing plans fell through. And truthfully, Jason did an amazing job at it. Like he really took it to another, another level that, that really impressed me. I knew he was going to do a good job. I didn't, I didn't think he was going to take it that seriously as he did. And he's absolutely missed in, um, 
he's absolutely missed in, in our little pit. Um, we had a lot of fun last year and, and those will be some memories that we had that we'll take on forever. Um, yeah, Coda was a little bit tough. I will say Coda was a little bit tough without Jason, but it is what it is. And I think the only thing we can do is continue on racing. Yeah, and I think he'd be very proud of what you've been able to uh, to put together and keep everybody involved and, and really turn that team into, to, you know, like a proper team, as, as Sean mentioned earlier. Yeah, I, I, I think if I can just add real quick, like Jason was actually supposed to be a part of this whole team as a racer. Right. Um, Jason was coming back racing in 2022, um, and we had some mutual sponsors and, and, and mutual ideas of our program. And and uh, we had plans to be under the semi together, under the canopy together and, and start racing. And then we even talked about in 2023 going superbike racing together. Um, so he he's definitely missed. And uh, yeah, we'll just race on in 2022 for Jason. Yeah, that's a good idea. We go to we go to Road Atlanta here next week. Uh you, you had a fresh start in the stock 1000 race. Obviously you've got a couple of races under your belt in the superbike class, but we do go to road Atlanta. It's the start of the stock 1000 championship. And I, I know that's your, your priority. You, you always seem to win a race. You always seem to get a bunch of podiums. What, what's it going to take to get to that? And you're not very far away from it, obviously, but to that next level of winning that championship. A little bit of consistency, um, which is kind of the reason that I went over to the Suzuki in the first place. Um, you know, having a little bit of experience on the motorcycle in 2020 when I rode for Dave Anthony the last two rounds of, of Superbike at Indianapolis and Laguna, um, I knew that this motorcycle was something that that would be consistent and that I could work with. I wasn't necessarily looking for the best motorcycle in any regard, in any, in any area of the racetrack, but I was looking for a motorcycle that was flexible and, and compliant and easy to work with. And I think we've really found that with the Suzuki. I need to, I need to be able to go to the racetrack and do my job without necessarily fighting the bike so much. Um, and that's really lent a hand just this winter. And at Coda, I feel like we got off to a really good start and I'm quite confident that we're going to be um, we're going to be in a place this year where I would like our worst days to be third place and, and be on the box. Um, but just staying consistent and, and keeping it upright and just putting in good results every weekend. I think that's what's going to um, get us to where our goal is of, of winning the Stock Thousand Championship. Michael, I want to ask you some questions about Coda, um, a couple of technical, quasi-technical things about it. So we knew that between last year and this year, they had resurfaced the track. And M Matthew uh, Skoltz was kind of amused by the fact that when I talked to Danilo, Danilo Petrucci about the track, he actually said that he thought the paved areas were bumpier than they were before. And Matthew thought, no way. I mean, if he thinks that's bumpy, wait till he gets to Road Atlanta, which we all know is kind of going to be the eye opener for that. But um, how did you find that track? I heard it was pretty abrasive. And it's, it sounds like from what I understand, you went with that, not the medium, but the soft front tire. And how, how were your tires after, after your racing? Uh, yeah, the challenge, the challenge of Coda was, uh, was getting the tire choice right. Um, you know, I had only ever been to Coda. I think I was there in 2018 for a press event. I maybe done 12 or 15 laps there prior to this last weekend. Um, so it was a, definitely a very fresh experience. I don't necessarily have um, relative terms to compare what I rode last weekend to as in the past. Um, but yeah, we were just, we were working on tires a lot and tire choice a lot. Truthfully, I wish I would have had like one more session because um, we raced the 0097 um, on Sunday afternoon on the rear tire. And, and you know, we, we thought about going a step harder with the medium um, and looking at it that way. But, you know, again, there, we only had so much time at Coda, um, but it was a challenge with the tires and it definitely was very abrasive. And there's definitely different surfaces throughout the course of a lap, which made it challenging as well. Um, but overall, I would say that Coda's in pretty good shape right now. 
I think uh, Danilo, yeah, it, it, it could be interesting for him when he gets to other places around the country and, and sees some of the asphalt that we're going to be working with. <laughs> um, and you were an example of somebody that I, I was concerned about and, and also wondered about with regard to the, the transition or, well, going from the Saturday afternoon race to the Sunday afternoon race, generally from one day to another, you don't race back to back. You generally have a warm up session, even though it's you know, earlier in the day or whatever, and, and would have been if it was in the morning at, at Coda, but you guys didn't have that. So you had some issues in that first race and you didn't really have other than a couple sighting laps, I guess, before the start of the next race. Was that kind of concerning for you? Because, you know, you didn't know if your bike was good to go and you had to find out. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't run it on the track before the race started, kind of. Is, is that the correct? Uh, yes and no. I mean, yeah, we had a little bit of an issue Saturday afternoon. I fell down on turn 12 at the end of the back straight doing literally 35 miles an hour. It was just a silly mistake on my part. Um, and I got back up and we continued on, on on the Saturday Superbike race. We didn't finish the race, but basically all I wanted to do was go out and get my confidence back right away um, and make sure I didn't make that mistake again and try and understand and wrap my head around what I did do. Um and so we went to bed Saturday night. I mean, the motorcycle was almost completely unscathed. Um, so we went to bed Saturday night and I will tell you, it was very nice to kind of sleep in on Sunday and not have a warm up <laughs> because it was such a long weekend, just getting the whole program and getting it all set up for the first time. I was exhausted. Um, so to sleep in and kind of be fresh on Sunday, uh, it wasn't too much of a worry. It's just, it's just racing motorcycles. It's what we do. So um yeah i was fired up for the race on sunday and it went pretty well and what was it like from one session with the other uh you guys were essentially well you guys were the first ones out on the track um on uh, friday morning super super early and it was cold it was a dirty track i understand there wasn't a lot of rubber down and uh i heard that was a little tricky and then you had to go into qualifying you you essentially qualified uh provisionally and finally qualified all in one day so um, that was, that was some crazy stuff going on there. W was that a lot of differences in the way the bike felt between those sessions? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Yes, for sure. Um, you know, Friday morning was really just a way for us to go see the racetrack. It wasn't like we were setting lap times at all. We went out when it was 46 degrees or something, um, when we first rolled out for the session. So really, again, I hadn't been there since 2018 and maybe it only ever done 12 or 15 laps around the place. So it was a way to way to check it out. And yes, the conditions were, were so much different, but in a way having three sessions on Friday, it gave us the ability to kind of just get into a flow and, and make those plans rather than, you know, on Saturday, there was a practice at eight in the morning and then we didn't race until five 30 in the afternoon. So, you know, to kind of get into the flow of things and, and have a plan for that entire Friday, I would say it's pretty beneficial for probably everyone there. Yeah. And one more thing about that, that code of conditions, you know, I think it was worse on Sunday than it was on Saturday, but my gosh, it was windy there. And I heard maybe it was turn 11. It was kind of sucking you guys in because of the way the wind was blowing. Did you experience that too, that that wind, when it came up in the afternoon for those races, definitely changed things a little bit too? Man, it was windy everywhere. Uh, it wasn't, it wasn't just one turn, but yeah, we, uh, uh, I, I'm more experienced at coming off of the back straight. Um, you go down, you go down your six gear wide open and you let off the brakes and, or let off the throttle and you would get pushed to the right side of the racetrack to where you'd almost have to start tipping in early, um, and braking a little bit early to make sure that you got down to the apex. And I was so kind of, I had a couple of deja vu moments when the wind got me of going into turn 12 and, and, and falling down on Saturday. I'm like, Oh, Oh geez, here we go again. Um, and then I, I can't remember the number of the corner. I think it's 18, the, the long right hander, um, you know, you come out and right as you tip into the right hander, you come out from behind the wall and the wind would come straight across you and start pushing you really wide. So you had to kind of anticipate those things um, and just be prepared for them. But yeah, it was uh, it, it was tricky conditions. Yeah. And then for that track as well, I was surprised when I was looking at the top speeds in different sessions 
you guys were all going a little bit slower in the races. And I think the wind obviously had a huge amount to do with that as well as the fact the track was, was pretty warm at that point. But um, Petrucci had a, had done a 195.7 top speed in practice two, which was that uh, Saturday morning uh, colder practice session which surprises me a little bit and a bunch of people had told me well he, that's the draft or whatever and people were asking where the top speed is on that track and um you, were you able to get pretty fast as fast as you could pretty much go and where is it it's not it's not across start finish is it is is it the back straight there where, where do you go the fastest on that track uh on the end of the back straight yeah i think um, typically most of the stock thousand machines, including myself, I think the highest speeds we saw was 182, 183. And that was typically in a draft. Um, it's hard to know exactly what laps those were and when we had drafts and whatnot, but we were consistently over 180 miles an hour on the stock, stock thousand spec bikes. That's, that's pretty impressive stuff. Um, the last thing I want to talk to you about um, is we touched on a little bit, but obviously you're being supported by Chuck Wally. You go out there a lot and explain for the listeners so obviously you're, you're a moto journalist you're a road racer but you're also a coach and you do a lot of that at chuck walla are you still affiliated with jp43 training and jason pridmore or do you have your own program now i mean how does that whole thing work no we uh i'm still with jason and and jp43 training it's something that we've um, I would say myself and Jason and, and Corey Alexander and a couple of the, the other regulars out at, out at Chuckwalla Valley Raceway have built. Um, and we've just built our one-on-one -on -one training platform. Um, and man, it feels like if I'm not, if I'm not out racing myself, I'm out at Chuck Walla teaching, uh, actually those guys are out there right now. And Jason was trying to get me to come out and teach all week. Um, but I'm like Jason, I have a real job too. I can't just bail all the time. So, uh, yeah, we're uh, we're out at Chuckwalla all the time, and and with JP forty three training, it's it's really been um, a lot of fun all winter long, and and obviously we'll taper off a little bit now for the Moto America season, and and it's getting hot out there too. Um, but yeah, still still doing a lot of coaching. Boy, I don't know how you keep your life straight, Michael. You got so much going on, and I know we see you sometimes when you're at the race weekends. You're you'll have a occasional conference call or you'll be working on a story or something so i know you put everything in but boy it's 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 got to be hard um with regard to your training i'm going to put you on the spot for a minute and i don't mm -hmm. know if you even answer this or it's even answerable but if you could impart a specific piece of wisdom on a motorcycle rider for the street or or track days what is what is the one most important thing you you tell a student or you would you would tell me for instance Man, that's tough. Yeah, um, I know it is. I'm sorry. <laughs> don't crash would be good. <laughs> well, yeah, I think that, man. Is it be smooth? Uh, is it, you, you know, brakes? I mean, what, what is it? I think that it's, you know, from my perspective, I think that it's, it's a willingness to learn and really choose who you're getting your guidance from. Um, that doesn't mean, like, I'm not trying to boast what we do at JP 43 training, but really look at who you're learning from and look at their background. You know, I think that motorcycle training is a very interesting thing. I think that, um, you know, we look at other sports, we look at, 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 you know, music, whatever people will pay for piano coach and they'll pay for a tennis coach and they'll pay for this and this and this and this, but then people have a little bit of an ego behind themselves with motorcycle training and motorcycle racing and yeah, it's probably a little bit more expensive than these other coaches out in the world, but the level of risk and the danger and, the, and, and everything behind it is so much more that it's like, we need to set those things aside, listen to trusted people with experience or coaches or, or uh, guides and go from there. I think that, you know, you can never stop learning and, and I've really put myself in the approach um, not only with motorcycling, but with other things around my life now, having had a coaching background that I'm always willing to listen and learn from, from people with more experience, with, from more experience than me. I hope that's a good one. Is that a good one? It's that's excellent. I mean, yeah. I thought I blew your mind there for a minute, but all it was was you were thinking and I, that's a well thought out answer. Thank you. Absolutely, man. Yeah. I, I, you know, obviously I want to see, 
I want to see motorcycling grow and and um, and to have people led in the right direction is is absolutely critical in that because obviously motorcycling is dangerous and we can make it as safe as possible and and as entertaining and enjoyable as possible. Um, that's what's going to help our entire industry. Well said. All right, Sean, you done with him or not? Oh, you know, I got more, but I'll just save it for later. I, I gotta Sean call just Mike. likes talking. I got to call Mike Pond and tell him I I missed seeing him and I feel like an idiot. So well, anyway. tell him you were Sean's just so busy with Quattararo that you didn't have a chance, you know, <laughs> and Jorge Martin. You know, I saw you spend a lot of time with those guys and then you, you ignore poor Mike. I don't get it. Oh, yeah. I was all about those guys and, and for <laughs> sure Peco Bagnaya. <laughs> yeah, you just like to say his name. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. <laughs> All I right, can barely get a, I can barely get a wave out of Sean at the races now. Oh, come on. I waved to you. It's You're true. My guy. You're my it's guy. It's true. Yeah. You, <laughs> I'll do better. You strive, you strive for a head nod every once in a while. Right. You know, if you yeah. could get that, things would be better. At least I go, Sean, at least I, I go to his pit and hang out and like talk about bicycles and coffee. I need to do that more. You're right. Yeah. All right. Lesson <laughs> learned. All right, you guys, uh, right. Michael, we're very proud of you and what you've been able to put together. And I think you're going to have a, a wonderful season and you'll get some sleep along the way, I hope, and uh, some good results and, and battle for that championship while also taking part in Superbike. So it's going to be a big season for you. And I think it'll be something that you can truly build on. And who knows, in 10 or 15 years, you might just be some old grumpy team owner with a bunch of kids under the truck or something. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate it. Uh... I appreciate the support and I appreciate you guys having me on and, and we'll uh, hopefully I get to say, say hi to Sean here more often out of the races. Yes. yes. We can, uh, we can offer, we can bring him into the pit give him a couple snacks and drinks and, and, and warm him up a little bit. You know, Sean, um, Gilbert and I get together every once in a while and do like millennial things like meet for coffee on our bicycles and stuff. It makes me, you know, he includes me in that and it makes me feel really young that I can do millennial type things like that. So well, you guys are the ones that actually got me to, I didn't originally know what the hell avocado toast was. So you guys are the ones that actually explained that to me. You guys yeah, even have avocado thing in Ohio. Yeah, we I was finally, just about to say. We finally, we finally have bagels out here. So, you know, that's kind of good. <laughs> yeah, you're, you might be a little farther away from an avocado though. <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, I think they get kind of spoiled by the time they get here. So, <laughs> All right, I'll bring you some to Atlanta. Oh man, that'd be awesome. All right, you boys. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, guys.